Okay, I guess we'll just get started. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to kind of let Austin introduce himself. I know that he's a constitutional attorney. And he is very well um, esteemed by a lot of people that I esteem as very good judges of character. So um, I was excited to get to meet Austin today. And he's going to be talking about, um, I just heard another term for it, P3s. Okay? Yeah public-private partnerships, and, and I had heard about them, but I don't know a lot about them, so I'm really interested in coming tonight in this talk. But um, the full title of the presentation is Public-Private Partnerships, the Constitutional Dangers of Public-Private Partnerships, how, do, how Corporate America is Being Used to Circumvent the Constitution, and that's a frightening thing, and so it's something we need to understand and know about. Hopefully, you will um, share the information you get tonight with those of you friends and um, associates, family, also with your elected officials, because um, I invited both of mine. I don't see them here yet, so I don't know if they'll be here or not. Maybe they're on the Zoom, um, Zoom feed, but I think it's important for them to understand because you know how it is in life. You get information, depending on who you get information from, it might not be really what you need at all. It might be one side of the story. So we are really quickly, and then I'll let Austin take over. Um, our organization is called United Women's Forum um, of Salt Lake. So there's a there's also a, a chapter up in Davis County, and we've been in um, we've been with this together for what about ten years? About ten years. Started out as a study group, uh, was for women, and we branched out to do many many more things. One of our signature things is we put on a Patriot Camp every year. For children six to twelve, and that's our big that's our big thing that we do every year. We're starting to get that organized for July. Um, but we also go up to the legislature. We we lobby for bill, not lobby. We uh, fight for bills. We speak at committee meetings. We read a lot. We study. We listen to people. We just try to educate ourselves because we know that if we're not educated, things happen that we don't want to have happen. So, Anyway, um, there's a sign-up sheet back there. If anybody wants to, Austin's got one. And then we have one from the United Women's Forum. If anybody would like to get on our email list, because I send out interesting emails, all very conservative, um, things that are happening, things that you might want to investigate. I try not to send too many, maybe three a week or something. But if you'd like um, to be on that list, you can sign up. And also, if you want uh, more information about what Austin's doing in his work and his campaign, um, we can send that out too. So, all right, we're going to turn it over to Austin. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go back and do it. Can I, John, may I just say something? What? I just, my name is Pat Jones. I'd just like to ask is there, uh, are there any other uh, uh, candidates here, county or state candidates here? Hi, I'm Mike Carey. I'm on for uh, Salt Lake County Council at large. What do you mean? Oh, look at that. That's a woman. So me asking this question is, I want to give recognition to our candidates who, who take the time to show up to Rich and Cunningham. Rich Cunningham, I'm in for South Shore and the Santa Claus District of Oregon. Mike, Mike is uh, Salt Lake County. Uh, at large. Sure. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, and then I guess, since you asked, I'm also running for Attorney General. <laughs> I am here too. <laughs> No, just kidding there. Um, but yeah, so glad to be here. We, in Believe, we do constitutional discussions, presentations monthly. And Believe is an organization meant to promote private solutions to societal issues. Is one of the big things that we work on. And that obviously takes us a lot into politics, a lot of things, just because the law often gets in the way of that. But I'm a strong believer in the Constitution. I've done constitutional work as an attorney. And our I Believe logo, you can see it up here too, but um, it does say I Believe with the color. And then the I is the person praying as well. And so one of the treats of coming to a meeting is that we do have wristbands or shirts. If you want any of those, you can take those. Um, I also love religious discussions as well. So I have a book back there. From a religious perspective, you're welcome to take one of those if you want. Um, but grateful to have you guys out today. I think that there's a lot of power in talking about the Constitution. 
and in learning about it. And especially, I, I really believe there's power in meeting together with people. Um, and I think that's something that's disappearing a lot from our society, that we don't like to get together anywhere as much. Um, so with these discussions, I try very hard to, I'm a strong believer that if we understand facts and principles, we make good decisions. So I'm not necessarily trying to sway you one way or another. It's not my goal. Uh, my goal is to present information and hopefully to get information from you guys, thoughts, opinions. But please don't take everything I say as gospel truth because the law is so vast. There's exceptions. There's all kinds of things to it that um, can play into and affect how things are done. In addition, I will present things that aren't necessarily true because they're opinions people have. Um, and so again, we talk about opinions, we talk about sides, trying to learn what the truth is. Um, but it's not everything I ask isn't because I believe it. It's to help highlight a point. So with this, the culture of our discussions that we shoot for uh, is to have a lot of different viewpoints. That's the goal. Um, we don't name call, we don't put people down. And we're even talking about not name calling others outside the room. You know, even if they're not here with us. I'm a big believer that we talk respectfully and that really promotes helpful dialogue. Uh, we don't interrupt to talk over others and be serious about trying to learn some new things. I'm a big believer in that. So here's some of the things that start right off the bat with why to be informed. Now these our opinions, they may not be absolutely true. Um, but Bill Gates says that how you gather, manage, and use information will determine whether you win or lose. Who in here believes there's any truth to that? And where does it not necessarily come true? Any thoughts? I don't think there's a it's for sure, like a win or lose to it, but yeah. So it helps. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on Bill Gates here? He obviously is an information guy. Yeah, so one of the things that a lot of people feel, and this is something I feel people, I think America's pretty agreed that there's misinformation out there. They're trying to sway us to something now who believes in misinformation. It's a big, huge debate. Um, but he says how you gather, manage, and use information. He doesn't say facts. He doesn't say truth. He just says information. Yeah, information is uh, powerful. Pick, 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 uh race for data collection there is a big race yeah. and that, that's the next quote yeah. so <laughs> i will say to your point so my we i work for a company and their their whole point is to help the military gather large amounts of information okay uh, and on any one of those fronts the the team who has the most information will definitely be more. Okay. So we're talking military strategy, those with the most information win. You're well, saying even even more than the most missiles? Yes. So if we want to go to something like as far as like game theory or something really out there. Okay. You would have to be so uh, the US military strongly believes this. They've they've watched Bill Gates. <laughs> um but so, and one reason I bring a private sector quote, Bill Gates, and then a government sector quote, because we're talking about public private partnerships. But Barton believes that the NSA's business is information dominance, the use of other people's secrets to shape events. Do you know what the NSA's stated goal is of their data collection? This is one I read on the NSA's website. Is it go out to people, go out to citizens? It's not. That's not their direct goal. The NSA's goal is to be able to predict, given any set of circumstances, what a country will do 
in response, what a community will do in response, or what an individual will do in response. They want to be able to prophesy. They are seeking the gift of prophecy with their God collection. So they must be big time AI users. They are big time AI users. They've got crazy algorithms. Who knows what they're doing? But their goal is they want to gather all the data possible to be able to say, if we put a worship over here, how does China respond? If we insert this fact into the community or this person's you know, dies or whatever, how does the society respond? How would I respond? And AI, predictive AI is becoming very, very good. Whereas humans, we have certain things that are um, habitual or predictable. And AI is really hammering down on that. So the government wants to be able to prophesy. And that's the NSA's job right now is to prophesy. And that's its, at least when I read the NSA's website, that was its stated goal of data collection. Uh, so coming on, let's see, this one might be dying. We have, I always try and share how I view things in case it helps paint a bias or anything like that. You can, you know, judge it as you would like. I view liberty as being a state between anarchy and tyranny. When we have anarchy, um, there's no laws. It's just the most powerful wins. When we have tyranny, I define that as we're ruled by all law. We don't have decision anymore. Somewhere in the middle of that, we have to have laws to pull us out of anarchy. But we have to have morality and private solutions to keep us from tyranny. If we as citizens don't step in and solve problems, the law will. And it moves us closer and closer to tyranny. The more laws we get, the more things that happen. And so defining exactly where that balance is is a very difficult task. But generally, you can start to fill as you get closer to it because the sometimes the uh, debates get a little more heated. It gets very nuanced right around the middle point. But this is how I view things. This is kind of how I talk about things. I'm a big fan of checks and balances. Um, because I specifically believe that we have to really push to keep things in balance. There's very few things that are absolute that you know, should just 100% be one way. Almost everything that comes up, even constitutionally, you can find something that taken to its extreme would be really bad. And there's almost a balance on everything that exists. Freedom of speech, for example, we don't get to defraud people. Um, we don't get to defame people. There's There's limitations put on even some of the most basic liberties. And so when we go into the Constitution, the premise of the Constitution is, the basic premise is it's regulating and restricting the federal government for the most part. So we're, we're often aware of the phrase that says, Congress shall make no law. So the question comes up, does the Constitution directly Constitutional rights amendments directly regulate private conduct. Anyone have any ideas on that? Depends on conduct. Well, what conduct might it directly regulate? Or ban or prohibit? Speaking of prohibit, well, there, there was a time when the Constitution very much directly prohibited alcohol. Okay. So that was removed. Good job. You, you got one of them. There was a time, Constitution directly prohibited alcohol, prohibited private conduct, right? Any other amendments you can think of that directly prohibit private conduct? We had a whole war over it in America. So Roe v. Wade is a constitutional, that's a Supreme Court interpretation of the Constitution. We're talking the text of the Constitution itself. Slavery. Slavery. So we had... A war, we say, we're not going to permit anyone to own slaves. So we had slavery, we had um, alcohol, prohibition. But for the most part, the Supreme, the Constitution is regulating the federal government. It has a couple restrictions on states, um, some of which are decently important um, and relevant today. But it doesn't usually restrict private activity. So that means, you know, we just went through a couple of rules that said we're not going to name call and different things. In a private setting such as this, we can create rules that the government might not be able to create in its own 
country because it's restricted. It can't impose restrictions on speech that we can. Um, so we're, we're, what we're going to do in talking about these public-private partnerships is we're going to go through and look at kind of the legal basis and the constitutional basis that are coming to a head that are creating some of the ways that the government is able to circumvent constitutional restrictions on itself. And so you need to keep in mind the Constitution generally doesn't directly regulate or restrict private activity. Do any of you know why corporations, limited liability companies, any of those things, do you know why they have protections under the Constitution? According to the Supreme Court, not too long ago, I can't, I'm trying to remember which specific um, case it was, but corporations have, according to them, free speech. Okay. And then you're probably talking about the case of Citizens United. Yes, this is right. Thank you. Uh, talking about corporations having free speech rights. Uh, but in general, corporations have been determined by the Supreme Court to have rights of a person, like me. They have rights to due process. They have rights to free speech. There's even some religious freedom extensions that have gone in there. Hobby Lobby, I've seen their lawsuits. Hobby Lobby is a corporation sues on religious freedom grounds and says, I don't want to do those things. They've been recognized as having religious freedom protections. Uh, just as a person would. So can you think of reasons why you can say it's a good reason, a good thing that we have corporations, constitutional protections, or bad reasons? Any pros and cons you see to that? Corporations have, especially going back to Bill Gates, corporations have large amounts of funding, large amounts of resources to you and I do not have in this, especially in this setting, when it comes to trying to, I'll say, push a, a message okay. to the public. So corporations are kind of a power center. Does that make it a pro or a con that they have protections? Could be both. Depends on what you're... Depends on if we like them or not. <laughs> yeah, and, and one of the things that we have to be very careful of is recognizing when something's allowed legally, it's allowed for both sides. And so sometimes we have to look at the good or bad and say, do we want this? You know, is it a good enough thing that it can be there? But corporations, we certainly have seen messages come from corporations. And some of them we're uncomfortable with, some of them we're comfortable with. And then there's a bunch that just choose not to say anything, right? Because they don't want to take off their customer base. Um, any other thoughts, though, why it's good or bad? There's uh, also the accountability aspect. If you, you, know, you can put a person in jail, you can't put a corporation in jail. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's can't a put a company in jail. We're trying in New York right now, right, with Trump's companies? Mm -hmm. Trying to ban them from New York and things? Uh, Tracy has a comment. And Tracy, you're muted right now. comment is like a current issue that's going on right now how okay. they are trying to ban TikTok. Yep. That is unconstitutional. You can maybe restrict to say that you can be malicious with our data, but restricting them from the market is unconstitutional. Yeah, so right now that's a great point. We're the federal government's proposing to ban TikTok, right? And remember, this was after President Biden created his TikTok account <laughs> for campaigning. Um, but that was something that people um, did make some fun of. And John has a comment. And you're muted as well, John. Yeah, John, I can't hear you. One thing you can't do with a corporation is you can't kill it. Um, meaning, uh, say like a corporation allows things to happen that cause death to people, knowingly choices are made, you can't kill the corporation. Like you can execute a, a person. prisoner that has caused murder. 
Yeah, and one of the things about a corporation that the courts recognize is that all corporations act through people. So in Trump's entities that are being prosecuted, there are people going to jail that were determined to be accountable for things. Um, and technically, we could pass a law that said if a corporation chooses to take an action that knowingly is going to kill people, kind of like the Ford Pinto. You guys know that story about Ford choosing to let people die. The law could go that far to say that is murder if they wanted. Um, generally, they haven't. Corporations tend to have a lot of protection, to John's point. So how 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 is the done right uh, NRA company? Because they are trying to sue the manufacturer, gun manufacturers. Yep. And so this is one where what they're doing with the gun manufacturers is they're not necessarily saying that the president of the gun company is going to jail for the person that died. They're saying, though, that company owes them money, and they're seeking to bankrupt these companies and suck all their money out of them through that liability. It's like what they had to do to Trump. Yeah, and that's, you know, Trump is, <laughs> he's got a few uh, few liabilities following him right now, imposed uh, by the courts. Um, but yes, with the gun side, they're trying to create a monetary liability, and that is how they often try and kill companies is through bankruptcy. So to that same extent, there's there's other corporations that are, I would say, are given more protection for their voice from the government in certain ways. Talk about Roe v. Wade. The government also funds Planned Parenthood to a large extent. Yeah, federal government gives some funds and things. Yeah, and how do you get on the nice list from the government? Object. You say what? Say object or disagree. To get on the nice list? To get on the bad list. Get on the bad list. I'm talking about being on the nice list where they give you money. Yeah, donate. Donate a lot. You've got a lot. Got a good lot here. <clears throat> yeah, so obviously donations you know, are part of it. But corporations in America have had this uncomfortable rub where people have been generally uncomfortable with all the constitutional protections being extended. But they're also uncomfortable taking them all away. And uh, because let's say that we're just a community of people and we decide to say we're going up to the government and saying, you know, we're members of Believe or we're members of United Women Forum, we are here speaking collectively. The corporation represents a collective voice of people, or it can. Um, and so when the courts have looked at it, they've said, well, you don't lose your constitutional protections just because you associate with others and say, you know, we're a different name. Think of the founding fathers with uh, the um, Federalist Papers. How many of them use their actual name in writing all those? None of them. They all use different names. They could have written together. They could have done some things together. And the Supreme Court, when they looked at the corporation side, they said, we're really not comfortable saying that there's no rights to a corporation because it's just a group of people. And if we take away a group of people's right to their constitutional rights, we're taking away their individual constitutional rights. So currently, corporations do have these, again, even the freedom of religion side. Um, I personally think the founders would have been a little bit wiser about corporations than we've been so far. Uh, I think they actually would have addressed them if they knew what type of companies we have today. Um, that's my personal opinion. We'll talk more about that if there's time. Um, but going on some of the background to what's happening right now. The Constitution, when it started, before amendments came along, um, the founders were concerned about the government's ability to suck money from the people or be oppressive through taxation. And so they actually put in limits on the federal government's power to tax. These are two of the limits that were put in. So it appeared in two different sections in Article 1. They talked about representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states according to their, to their respective members. So taxes were supposed to if you're paying out taxes from the federal government, it's supposed to kind of go to all the states based on the number of people in it. 
So the federal government wasn't supposed to say, oh, we like New York, but we don't like Rhode Island. Um, they were supposed to, yeah, yeah, apportion things based on numbers. And then they said there was no direct tax that shall be laid unless it was in proportion to the census, meaning everyone paid their fair share into it. Um, so again, they can tell one state they had to produce more than the other. It was all based on pro rata um, according to the census. This created some issues for the government. Um, come the 1890s, the federal government wanted to have an income tax. And there's no way for an income tax to come out pro rata like the Constitution wanted. And so the Supreme Court struck it down, said it's unconstitutional. No federal income tax under the existing Constitution. So what happens? The, they weren't uh, discouraged by that. They went to work and told the states how amazing it would be if they could do an income tax. Let's pass an amendment because it's banned by the Constitution. So the 16th Amendment comes along, and notice here, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes without apportionment and without regard to any census. So the 16th Amendment just took away, stripped away two checks and balances that the founders felt were important to have in place mm -hmm. to stop the growth of the federal government. And if you want to look at the history of federal debt in the United States, once the government has a new source of tax, a new way to get that tax, the debt takes off. <laughs> so when you have access to more money, you can borrow more money. It's kind of amazing how that happens. And it goes a little crazy. So when it was passed in 1913, the you know, the 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 pitch to the states and the people was don't worry. Just one percent. We can do so much with this. Max of seven percent for this uber wealthy. They got to be making over eleven million dollars a year. Um, and within five years of the amendment being passed, we're at a seventy-seven percent tax bracket. Did World War One drive that, or what? So they they say history says war is expensive, but you're going to see that we reach a higher point. And we sustain it even when we're not at war. So certainly war was a contributing factor to it. What did it raise? But it, well, it, it actually did go down. You'll see that it didn't stay there forever. We had Reagan come in with his Reaganomics, right? Um, but you'll see it stays pretty crazy. And I'll show you the stuff here in a second. So by 1944, again, this is World War II now, it's up to 94%. Do you know how many days? So if you work 100 days and you're earning money 100 days, 94 of those days, your money is going to the federal government. It's pretty painful at this point. Um, so Will Rogers, you know, we talk about death and taxes, but he says, well, at least death doesn't get worse every time Congress pays. Uh, and so... These are some of the charts if you look at. So this is where it spikes to 77%. It did come back down following the war, kind of during the Depression. People didn't have much. But then even in Depression years, it starts to skyrocket because we start getting the socialist programs coming in under FDR. It's got to fund them. It shoots up here to the 94%, and then it hangs out here all the way through the 60s. Yeah. Super long time, eventually drops down, kicks up a little, come to Reagan era, it drops, and it continues, and then it hangs out around here. Um, this is gone, yeah, this is about, this only goes through 2008 for that one. Um, but you can see corporate tax rate kind of follows uh, under, and then right now the corporate tax rate is down at 21%. And, but it's still, pretty sizable chunk. And remember, the federal government didn't have this power. The founders didn't give it to them. They had concerns about it. Um, and so what, looking at these charts, what do you think one of the serious oversights was in passing the 16th Amendment? If you're going to let the federal government tax run income, what should you do along with that? You should put a check and balance in place, right? You say max of X. 
constitutionally. Require a balanced budget. Require a balanced budget. And I don't I don't even know if people then were thinking that we would go into an enormous debt. Um, they, I don't think they realize that when you have more capital accessible, people will loan you more money. Um, but, but yes, why do pe why are people so willing to loan America money right now to the tune of trillions of dollars? It's because the government can say, oh, 90 percent, we'll just take it. And they've got a captive workforce and they can just take the funds, right? So they can borrow all they want. So one of the lessons from this the world's largest economy, so it's pretty easy for yeah, someone to say to your point, like, hey, they've got the largest economy, so they've got the largest tax base. Yeah. So it's a pretty pretty good bet. It's a pretty good bet, right? Your money back. <laughs> Just gonna, I'm looking at your two lines there. The, the red is the corporate institution. Yeah. So, so, I mean, corporations don't pay tax. People that buy their product or use their service pays the tax. So it's almost like you putting that line on top of the other line. It's, it's still less than a thing to tax. Yeah, so it is helpful to realize that when they're paying 52% of their income, um, that is then. <laughs> Those people up here paying 91% are paying 91% of the 48% that's left. And so it is, it's a, it is a double tax. Corporate tax is a double tax on the owners, um, potentially consumers. You know, there are different ways people argue it gets paid. Consumers are paying it through what they buy. Owners are paying it up twice through what's taking place. Um, Okay, yeah, because it's, imagine again, think of it like this. If the government comes in and says, oh, you're a group here, and you guys made $5 million together. Well, we want um, half of that. Boom. And then, in addition, each of you individually owe us some money. That's what's happening to companies. Is those owners are getting a chunk taken, and then what's left, they then get taken again. And so, it is. It's, it's, it's a double hit. Um, Except the owners is Going back to some risk and leaving multiple things to hide their Some of them. <laughs> there are like Apple. Apple's a great example of being a law abiding citizen. They went to, I always forget if it's Iceland or Ireland. I get the two confused. Um, one of those, though, loves big corporations. And they have one of the world's lowest tax rates for big corporations. And Apple went and struck a deal with them that if they put a headquarter in their country, that they wouldn't charge Apple tax. Apple was able to set up structures that comply with the tax codes. But all their money funnels out through this. And the EU eventually caught on and went, wait, why has Apple not paid any money in taxes to us? And they went and looked at it and tried to figure out what Apple was doing illegally, and it was all above board. And because of their treaty, whatever they had with Ireland or Iceland. And so the EU got kind of upset and came after the country and said, the country, you're violating your charter with the EU. You're supposed to contribute your fair share. So you go collect that from Apple. And right now the country's in a legal battle with the EU over being forced to collect taxes and violate their contract with Apple. Um, it's a wild scenario to look at, but Apple's put, I'm sure, hundreds of millions into evading taxes, and they've saved billions upon billions. Um, they're a smart company, if you want to call them that. Um, so we get to what, what's happening, though, with this, with this. We have to understand the system that's now in place. The system that's in place is that the federal government can take money from states, any state they want, you know, if California makes a lot more than us, California is paying way more in taxes because they're in a higher tax bracket than we are. New York, it's the same. And then the government can sit on it and say, oh, we don't have, you know, remember, we got rid of this. Um, let's see. We got rid of this apportionment among the several states, the census thing, so we can give it to our friends. We get to choose where it goes at this point. And so the federal government comes in and they start to realize this pretty quickly. They have this tax and credit power um, where they can 
go, oh, we have all this money sitting in our war chest. If you want it back, I'll give it back to you, but with some strings attached. And by the 1930s, the government was doing this, it was challenged uh, in court, this tax and credit power, you know, as to what could happen. And so the court's looking at things. Now, they weren't looking at these exact issues. They had different issues. Can the federal government constitutionally say, hey, states, we don't have the power to regulate education. Under the Constitution, the courts have said the federal government doesn't have the power to regulate education. But we have a Department of Education. It exists because the federal government says to the states, hey, you want some money back? We took it from you. You want it back? We'll just follow our rules. Don't worry, it's not a law. You don't have to. But all the other states will just be way cooler than you if you don't take it. Um, so constitutionally, should the government be able to do that? Should the government be able to require any recipient of Medicaid funds, hospitals, others, to vaccinate employees to receive the funds? Should the government be able to say, oh, hey, state, you press some diversity, equity, inclusion, friendly laws. We like you. We'll give you more money. Should they be able to give money directly to corporations that engage in diversity hiring, if the government likes that? Or make electric cars. Or make electric cars. Or make solar panels. These are all questions. And what do you guys think? How does it feel internally? Does it feel like something that should be allowed? Does it feel like something that we consciously gave up with the 16th Amendment? What are your thoughts? We think bribing's okay, but sure. Okay. So, who is it that can't bribe who in the law? I can't bribe a government official, but they can bribe me, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the DEI seems to me like a, a sort of religion, like that's being forced by the federal government down onto corporations and people. Okay. So are you saying that should be unconstitutional because they're pushing a religion? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, that is uh, the uh, um, supposed separation of church and state that everyone talks about. But you know, if they don't call it a religion, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not. So maybe we should start a DEI church and then see what happens, if they can still do it after that. No, no. Yeah, sometimes it just takes playing the game, right? Did you have something? I really think it's turned, the 16th Amendment has turned the whole system into a mafia construct. Okay. Because they just dictate if you don't do what we want, then you can't get the money. Yeah, and so they, they, they do play this game. Now, again, we can look at it on the other side. Um, so this is usually the other side of the political spectrum. Should they be able to give money to states that help enforce immigration policies? Should they be able to give money to states that ban abortion or that fight illegal drugs or that ban pornography? I think this whole thing of giving money itself is just legalized bribery. Okay. So just call it what it is. Hmm? So you're saying just call it what it is? Yeah. It's bribery? It's this fancy way of doing the same thing. It is legalized at a very high scale. So it will rival any third world country by making it legal. So Regardless of how we feel about the exact issue, is this something you feel the government should be able to do or not be able to do? No, not being able to do. So you're not fans of it? I'm just I'm interested. I've never even considered these ideas before, but to me it sounds like the government's taking their money in order to bribe us. So they have it so they can give it back. Yeah. They shouldn't even be taking it in the first place. They shouldn't have it so they would be bribed. Yeah, so it's it's one of the interesting things. We talk about corporations. Again, you can't really tax a corporation because it's a group of people. What's the government? It's a group of people, right? The government is us in a way. And so when we give the government the power to tax without checks and balances, we're giving them the power to then control us through money and say what, what goes on and what doesn't go on. Well, I think to your point, though, really depends on the group of people Right, but you would say you are comfortable with the government being allowed to do. So, the Constitution, as far as I understand, does clearly say that the government will 
put forward a military. Yep. That the government will support. Um, at the time, it supported the post office. Um, I think now that you know that'd be far far more akin to supporting it. Uh, I would say an open and free communication system would that be the internet or something like it. But clearly, I think that a lot of people would say, to some extent, people like roads, people like you know similar things, right? Like they like firefighters, police, right? So it's 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 what entities we're we're willing to support. Um, and clearly, I'm sitting in a conservative room with people, so I tend to lean more towards, you know, being less taxed and, you know, how much the government gives, but, I, but to, to the extent that you're not incorrect with a far left leaning group of people would say, or are more likely to say that they would give the government their money because they think the government's trustworthy to run social or all sorts of other items. Yeah, and they... But again, it goes to this kind of deeper question to say whether we like the actual policy that's getting money or not, do we feel that this is an appropriate use of government power? Now, to the point, the government has to create roads, or at least based on our system, we currently do that. There are other methods we could choose, but we chose roads, we chose military, government runs those, they'll stick money. So it has to be taxes. But going back to the balance point, we have to have something to pull us out of anarchy. We need some collective force to say we're going to have military, we're going to have defense. But if there's no check and balance, what happens? The whole system starts to go skim off us and get um, to spin out. And the founders put in this check and balance of apportionment among the states and in relation to the census and a couple of these things that made it so this, the federal government couldn't favor parties. It just if it was going to spend money, it had to spend money on everyone kind of thing. Is one of the things that they put in. Um, I think the Wright brothers have an interesting story in that when they designed the airplane, they did it off of their revenue from selling bicycles. And I, I cannot remember the numbers, but at the same time, the government was sponsoring this other entity that was, that was government trying to create airplanes. And they put 30 times more money, I don't know, like some huge, massively huge number, larger than what the Wright brothers had received to create the airplane. And the efficiency between them, the government program never really got it off the road, but the Wright brothers in their own private sense did. And I, I kind of look at it and I'm like, we feel like, um, the numbers are so big, we have to get tax dollars to do it. But I wonder if we didn't feel that way, if we felt more empowered as a people, like if the system could be completely different, actually more efficient and even better yeah. than what we have. And it's a great point. People often talk about how they don't feel the government's efficient at things. And that's one of the principles we're going to talk about that's actually leading to one of these, one of the big problems we're having with these partnerships with corporations. Um, but I look at government efficiency when China flew their balloon over the United States. If I remember right, the US used a missile that cost $700,000 or something to shoot down a balloon. And it, almost anything could have popped it. And they shot a $700,000 missile at it. And you think, it would be helpful to have a budget sometimes to say, let's, let's actually make some good decisions rather than an unlimited purse we can pull from. The military's credit, though, it's really hard to pop a balloon at 65,000 feet. Okay. So <laughs> we, we that, that is one thing they say, but one thing I say in response is, do we really not have a cheaper way, though, to pop a balloon at that elevation still? Have we not looked at those things? Again, I, I look at to the point of innovation. You know, part of me says there's so much money that's gone into it. Have we never considered balloons? Because even in World War II, they were fighting with balloons. They use all kinds of stuff. Um, and does it really cost $700,000 to shoot one down at that altitude? I don't know. But it feels a little unfortunate to me. Well, I once heard um, this thing, when you 
when we go and buy something for ourselves, we are concerned about the quality and the price. Yeah. Because we're purchasing for ourselves. When we go and buy a, a gift for somebody else, we are concerned about the price, but less about the quality. The government, it's not their money. It is the people's money. They don't care about the quality. They don't care about the price. Yeah, and that is, and that, that starts to happen when there's not systems built in. So in an economic system as private individuals, we have a natural check and balance of a budget with finite resources. So we have to be picky about it. When we don't put checks and balances in place on government spending, they don't have this pressure. They just have, oh, we'll just get it from the people again. You know, it's just there. And that does impact what we do and how we do it. So these these questions we were talking about did come up to the Supreme Court. So 1937, it makes it there. Virtually all the justices said, this doesn't violate the Constitution. So the federal government can, they're not passing a law. They're not making anyone do this. If they want to condition, you know, obligations on the receipt of funds, they can do that. There was a dissenting justice, though, that said these provisions in question, he says, if they don't amount to coercion in a legal sense, which means they're not a law, they can't, the government can't force you to do it. He says they're manifestly designed and intended directly to affect state action in the respects specified. And if valid is so employed, this tax and credit device may be made effective to enable federal authorities to induce, if not indeed to compel, state enactments for any purpose within the realm of state power, and generally to control state administration of state laws. So they were looking at specifically as it related to giving money back to the states. But what else can the federal government control besides states with money? Well, as you mentioned... So going back to the education, right? Title IX is something the government's used in multiple cases to try to push. And, and it changes by who's in power, by the way. But Title IX is being certainly used to push certain things through the education system. Yeah, so the education they're controlling. What else is the government telling us what to do with? Help. 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 So that goes down to... Corporate level, hospitals, nonprofits, individuals, even. We've seen some of that come out. Um, food, is that what you said? Yeah, food. They're, they're, they're realizing they can control almost everything. Is that saying we don't need to pay our taxes? <laughs> That'd be nice if that's what it's saying, but um, no, that's not what that's saying. Don't don't take that legal advice from here. Okay. We'll get in trouble for not paying your taxes. The IRS has launched their they're launching their wave of the next hundred fifty thousand audits. They're coming to collect some money. Um, so be aware. So one of the things I want to point out there's a scripture back in Daniel. I don't know if you guys know the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had different names. They were Jews in Jerusalem. They're kind of youth children. They get taken captive and get brought in before the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon says, well, I've got all the food you can want in the world. Essentially puts the riches of the world in front of them and says, come eat with me. And they say, no, there's something we want more. And based on the story, it says, this is a quote from the scriptures, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. So they, they've, they chose to forego the riches of the world to have something different. Right now, the government's coming out and saying, we know how to um, take away constitutional rights. We know how to circumvent freedom, all these different things. It just takes money. People will sell their freedoms. And the government's currently in the business, I believe, of starting to really push to buy our freedoms from us. And so when we see where we're at, one of the moral things we have to recognize for ourselves is if we don't have the self-control to say no to all the riches of the world, then we may never get the deeper, more important things in life, such as liberty. And that's the place we're at and part of what we are doing as a people. And so when we go to into the partnership issues now, so now we have government working with corporations. We talk about these partnerships. 
when does the government absolutely have to work with the corporation? Just, we think it's a good thing. Under the declaration of an emergency. Sorry, what's that? Under the declaration of an emergency. Oh, you mean like COVID? <laughs> are you saying that's a good thing or no i'm just you said when okay so it would be well, let's just let, let's just say some that you would agree with the standard thing they do is they contract with private companies to build roads okay so do you believe it's better for the government to contract with private companies or should they have their own road building crew? well so that's a dangerous question yeah yes. because they are they are so bureaucratic they are poor I don't believe anybody who don't actually drives a car. So I don't know. I don't I don't know if you're there for me. I I um vastly superior to the private sector groups out through the government and just about anything. Yeah, anything. Yeah. So like except for landing on the moon. Well, so <laughs> to that point though. So if you look at NASA's current expenditures versus SpaceX, the current expenditures, SpaceX is vastly yes. like dominating what NASA's done over the last 30 years. And they've done it in less than 10. Well, kind of. The moon side. So assuming that, you know, again, the, the government's claim is they made it to the moon in what, 10 years or something under 1960 technology. SpaceX has been at it for almost 20 years now, or 20 years, somewhere around there. And so it is interesting to see kind of this thing of, we're really struggling to land on the moon privately, um, which again, some people then question, well, did the government really make it based on the technology then? Um, but to your point, they may have had more money to spend, a lot more to put at it. Um, but so when we talk about efficiencies, and let's say military. One of the things, do you know that the government contracts with private companies to provide soldiers? So we have BlackRock, we've got a couple of these companies, they're paid mercenaries. Our government hires people, they're not part of the military, and they're sent over to kill people. Is that a good use of government efficiency to say the private sector does it cheaper? So again, we, we start to get into these really interesting issues as we look at corporations, because when it comes to road building, most, I'd say that probably most conservative people would say, we want it to be more efficient. We want to spend less in taxes, hire the private sector to do it. Don't have a government construction crew to build every building. If you need a courthouse, just pay a builder to build the courthouse, please. It's far better and far cheaper. Um, and so there are situations, I think, where I believe we could find everyone in America would probably agree, okay, that's a situation you'd hire a private company for and pay them some tax dollars to have a service provided. Um, you know, the government probably doesn't have to produce its own paper. It can buy that from somebody, for example. It can buy its computers from IBM or Google. And we probably aren't going to make any the government make every computer that it uses. Uh, go ahead online. We got John. You're muted again, John. One of the things that I would say is so one of my biggest concerns of the uh, corporate government using corporations is privatized prisons. Okay. And that is one that exists. Do you know that there are corporations that own and run prisons? Yeah. So, like, for instance, there's a, a number of prisons here in Utah. Uh, as of very recently, that the only way you could talk to an inmate was is was through a TV screen. You couldn't even go ahead and cost you like 20 bucks. It's like 20 bucks every 15 minutes or every half hour, but it was, you know, uh, and then the only way that a corporation can grow is by finding ways to get more people in. Yeah, if you're in a prison and you want to grow or get more money, then you have um, to get more people in there because you're getting paid per person. And so then that does lead to some interesting moral conundrums about how are, you know, who's pushing these laws? Why is so much of America 
can be. Well, we have to also, system. We also have to remember that companies exist to make money. Yeah. So they want to find ways to make money. Correct. Yeah. And so yeah. think about it with, with BlackRock. Yeah. If they're publicly traded, they're expected to continuously grow. Yeah, because it's actually it's actually a legal obligation that then comes on them. Yes. You have to work to provide a return to your shareholders. So like BlackRock. Yeah, so if you're a private company that has soldiers, what do you need to have happening in the world? Constant war. You need constant war. If you are a company that manufactures $700,000 missiles for government, what do you need? Balloons, Chinese balloons. You need balloons. You know, that was probably China just getting $700,000 back, right? They probably built most of those parts. Uh, and the other part is because uh, government has uh, politicians who have to be paid by the corporations, then they'll just pay their campaign finances to get the lucrative contracts. Yeah. So it's just an investment into the politician to get a massive return. So you could almost say the private sector is encouraged to use the government right. as a social force, as a principle. Yeah. Where things from to do certain things, right? So money starts to become an incentive that is now driving political decisions. And again, one of the root ways this is being used against conservatives is that generally as conservatives, we say don't regulate businesses. Let them do their thing, keep the government out of it. But if there's no check and balance in this interaction with government, it starts to get really, really messy really quickly. That's how you get chips and dollar and baby for the coming up chip. And do you guys have any idea how many bombs per year, missiles, bombs per year, the U.S. is dropping around the world? I forgot to put this number in here. I wanted to, I meant to do it, but you can go and Google um, history of U.S. bombs just for the last decade. There's over 100,000 bombs the U.S. has dropped around the world. Where are we dropping them? It's a great question. Mostly in Africa. Um, Syria, Middle East countries, um, South America, some in South, uh, maybe in Venezuela type places. Um, but Africa is in a constant state of war. Not not all parts of Africa, but significant parts of Africa. And we drop a crazy number of bombs. We've been at war in Syria. Russia and the U.S. have been fighting each other in Syria for over a decade, and we're dropping crazy amounts of bombs. And it's just kind of a, I don't know, it's, it's a little wild. Um, but what's happening, what happens, so what kind of this, where this is really getting a rub is the government can give money with strings attached. Private realm corporations can impose requirements that the government can't. So what are the scenarios that you see start to happen when the government can say, here's some money, you don't have to take it, but it's here. And a private company that says, I can tell people what to do. You can't tell them, but I can. What starts to happen? What are some of the scenarios that come up? Vaccine requirements. Okay, so vaccine mandates. So that is the government telling a recipient of money, what to then tell others to do, right? Yeah. So now we have the government telling a company to tell others what to do. What other scenarios come up? Well, even healthcare in general, like my wife, uh, she's incentivized to go see doctors. She's paid to do this. Um, she moves six pounds over a certain duration. She gets money back from the uh, health insurance entity. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I remember one time the health insurance company said, here's your gym membership voucher. Mm -hmm. I was going, why are you sending me a gym membership voucher? And then I think it's real. Oh, you're saying it saves me. It saves you money if I go to the gym. And then I think, well, what gym was in on that? You know, I don't know. I just started to think through these things. Um, but what other scenarios come to your mind? And possible ways this plays out. I saw five that I could think of. Um, the government directly tells the recipient what to do. Um, or the government tells the recipient, private company, to tell others what to do. 
because they want more. The converse can be true. The recipient tells others what they have to do to now access the government agency or service um, because the government's using them to provide something. The recipient tells the government what they have to do uh, or the recipient goes lobbies for more laws, more funds, more control, and or less competition because we want these things happening, right? We're thinking about EPA gave us back and forth depending on the administration. Um, clearly the EPA has said we want to regulate carbon emissions. Yep. And so let's say coal power and now even natural gas is bad. Right. And so the government's telling the recipient in terms of who, who provides electricity to us, how they have to create it. Yeah. For example, I was just using it. No. It, it is a good example. These are things that start to happen. So we're going to go through each one of these. I'll give you an example of each. There are, unfortunately, hundreds <laughs> of examples, unfortunately. Um, but I'm trying to keep it relevant to my close to home. So the government tells the recipient what to do. How many of you know about the Utah Fits All Scholarship that was passed last year? Um, so with that, a private schooler or homeschooler can receive $8,000 in funds from the government per year per child to spend on private school or homeschool needs. But this is listed, this is a direct quote from the law. It's in there four times in the bill. Uh, it's HB 215 from 2023. It says in order to receive funds, a recipient shall comply with the anti-discrimination provisions of 42 U.S.C. Section 2000D and enter into an agreement, private contract, with the program manager. Who's the program manager? Have any idea? <clears throat> Sorry, what? It's not the state. Companies selected by and, well, private companies. And you. Private company. It's a it's a nonprofit. Yeah. So called nonprofit. It's a nonprofit that is set up to administer all this money. So the state hands this nonprofit all this money and says, go do it up. Why does the state give it to a nonprofit? So they can make rules. So the nonprofit can make rules, the government can't, right? That's their way of controlling our education. It's their way of controlling education is to say, well, I can't directly tell the homeschoolers what they have to do. The Supreme Court's come down pretty hard and said, yeah, education rights, parents have those. You really can't tell a homeschooler what they have to do. So homeschooling has been one of the last bastions of freedom. And now the government's saying, oh, yeah, here's $8,000 per child. That is far more money than I'd say probably 95, 96% of homeschoolers spend on a child per year. People aren't spending that kind of money to homeschool. It's not necessary. Um, but you, you take the funds. If you're a service provider that provides some type of service, you mentor the kids or any of those things, you have to agree to be bound by federal law. So now the federal government has a direct tie to homeschoolers in Utah. You took the funds. You're subject to this code provision. <laughs> And the federal government can update that at any time it wants, can do whatever it wants, and they now directly regulate homeschoolers in Utah. Well, this is not as it seems. <laughs> you better look into this a little bit more. Yeah, but they'll have they just ignore us. That families have the money. money. I wonder if that happened again in the state school board, which is just brilliant. She read one of our codes out of the state that was in the Utah you know, Constitution that basically negated one of the things they were doing. They were spreading money. Anyway, it was it was pretty obvious what it was. And literally this is what one of the more legislators said. I was sitting right there. I heard, well, this is just too great of a program. We just can't worry about that. And they just, they just clearly broke a law and ignored it. Yeah, it wasn't just a law, it was a Utah constitutional provision right. that they violated to pass this bill. Yeah. And then, it's 
And there's actually a judge. I was just reading a case that came down March 1st. And the judge said, I, I really respect this judge. He said, no matter how good the program is, government, you still have to do it constitutionally. He said, you've given me all the reasons why this program is great. He said, I don't care. It's not constitutional. And he strikes it down. Um, but when we talk to our representatives, we just say, it's great. It's going to help a kid, right? Maybe it will. Um, I'm sure it will help someone. But we now have, again, direct tie to the federal government and this intermediary program manager. We don't get to, as citizens, we don't get a vote on who that person is. We don't have a say in that. Just a nonprofit that's doing its thing. They still earn a salary. Yeah. They get paid no matter what, no matter how much we like them or don't like them. But it's for the children. <laughs> it's for the children, not just for the children. No. We're told it was also to compete with public schools and force them to change. Sure. And so they're going to get better through competition, is what they said. Um, the second one so the government tells the recipient what to tell others to do. We've kind of brought this up. COVID mandates from the government. Most of the time, the government wasn't placing the direct restriction on us. They were telling the business what they had to tell others to do. This one is highly concerning to me because this one is actually the, the government's conscripting new police officers with this. They now have a whole private force of police officers. They say the businesses, you've got to enforce this. You're now our police officer. Now, these mass mandates, there were a couple security guards shot and killed over them. People were upset. Tons of employees had to deal with, um, you know, tense harassment, other things from people. Employees of a company getting paid 20 bucks an hour, 15 bucks an hour, they're not trained to be police officers. They're not trained in de-escalation techniques. They don't carry weapons to protect themselves, but they have to mandate these things and enforce these things. You know, businesses are being told to do vaccine passports and others. And one of the ways I see public-private partnerships, again, this is kind of an expansive use of the term. To me, it's just any government-private company relationship is that the, the ability for a business to survive is getting harder and harder when the government subsidizes everything, puts money into everything. Um, how do you compete as a business once the government's subsidizing all the other businesses? They can do things cheaper. If you don't take the government money, how do you stay in business now? Um, but then there's strings attached. You have to do things. You have to be a police officer. You have to be a tax collector. If you're going to be in business, you got to collect taxes from your employees, send them back to the government. You go to jail and your employees, if you don't take out your employees' taxes, you have to collect it from every customer and collect it when a product's sold. And these are things that the government's been doing for quite some time to me in the, again, the private partnership realm. Constitutional COVID, like, let's not forget the fact that we all got jailed into our homes. For a minute, that one was that one. The governor got some threatening letters and they backed down really quick on that. Um, so that one didn't get tested in court because of how quickly they backed down. They did try it, they tried to direct regulation, but with the letters from attorneys, they backed down super fast. Well, it's still happening in a whole lot of other places. Um, but some of those things were struck down by courts. So even California Ninth Circuit, liberal Ninth Circuit, they had a case um, where the public schoolers and private schoolers, all, all school kids were told they couldn't meet together. It had to be all remote learning. Public school students sued, private school students sued. And it went up to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit said, hey, we don't care about public school kids. The government can tell them whatever they want. But the government can't. Tell a private school not to meet together, it said. The Liberal Ninth Circuit said that, even under COVID. And there was a case in Kentucky where the Louisville mayor ordered people not to attend church on Easter Sunday. That was struck down crazy fast. They sued, it was struck down the next day, I think. Um, and so those ones didn't fare well when they were challenged, the direct imposition on people. Um, this one I think is really interesting. I'm seeing this more and more. So this is where the recipient is telling others what they have to do to access the government agency or service. How many of you have ever gone camping, booked your site online? It's nice and convenient, right? It's through a private company to access 
government lands. And so in their terms of use, I thought you just might appreciate knowing what you're signing up for. You can send to the collection and use of certain information about you, including the transfer of this information to the United States and or other countries. We'll just Short storage. give it wherever we want. Um, so there you go. Why are we doing that? I don't know. Now, again, to kind of go to this point about private companies, what they can do, the private company is saying you as a user can't use threatening, abusive, hateful, vulgar, or otherwise objectionable language. You can't advertise. Uh, you can't have unsolicited commercial communication. The government can't tell us that under the freedom of speech, but a private company can't. And now the private company is controlling access to our federal lands. So that doesn't happen without a contract. Okay. Correct. And this why, is a contract. Why, why couldn't someone sue the federal agency for entering into a contract that violates constitutional rights? It's a good question. Um, it's because if, so this, this gets into one of the sticky areas of if the federal government had to, in their contract, uphold every constitutional right, then every private entity would essentially become a government entity. They become subject to the same rules. Yeah, but most contracts have pronoun provisions, and, and you know that's that's true for law too. You know, I mean, they can have flow down provisions. Does the government have an option to not enforce? Constitutional yes. rights through blowout provisions. Yes, it does. They do. They wow. do. Okay. Because there are some provisions that no one would sign up for. If you become a government employee, you don't want to be subject to due process and the firing of an employee. That's miserable. No private contractor wants to have due process rights apply in their business. And so they want to do business with the government if they have to comply with all the things the government has to do. And so to just out of necessity to have a private party contract with you, they don't have to follow everything the government does. Because uh, it's it's not fun being the government. That's I will throw that out there, at least like we talked about with the military, give them something. It's not a fun job. Um, we're full of candidates here, but yeah, it's not a fun job, right? Nice. Um, <laughs> but but again, this is interesting. And you'll see now the government is getting more and more online services. More and more companies are becoming an intermediary between us and accessing the government service. If you want to file a deed in your county, most counties have signed up with Simple File. It's a private company. It's nice and convenient. But they can put in whatever they want to put in. And now we have this issue of can I access things because there's these other parts in play. Um, and these companies are starting to get power to do different things with this. So number four was the recipient tells the government what they have to do. This is a fake picture. It's not true. Um, but do you remember USPS used to be this nice, religious friendly, non-Sunday job? They switched to Sundays. Why did they switch to Sundays? Yeah, delivering for Amazon. Because Amazon said, if you want our business, you got to do it. Now, we were told, I was reading the articles around this time, people were asking, well, what are the terms? Are you paying the, are you paying USPS extra? These contracts with private companies, they're not subject to Freedom of Information Act requests or grammar requests. They're accepted from it. Government gets to set whatever terms it wants with private companies in many situations, and you can't get access to those contracts. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going on. No one knows what the contract with Amazon said with USPS. And they wouldn't disclose it. And so that's just apparently WikiLeaks or whatever didn't hack that one. I don't know. Um, but they were now telling the government what to do. We have on record companies like Microsoft going into com countries in Africa and saying, you will pass these laws if you want our product here. If you want to be able to connect with the rest of the world, this is what you have to pass and do. 
the UN does that all the time. It's just more for the work from most kind of health issues. Yeah, they, they can hold a lot over their head, right? Accumulate resources together, and then there's power to say who's, who gets to divvy them up and attach strings to it. And so, number five, this one gets into some really fun stuff. We're going to go into three things here in Utah. Again, this is widespread all over the place. Um, why was the point? Why was the prison moved from the point of the mountain? Who wanted the land? Developers. Developers. Does the government care how valuable the land is it's sitting on? No, it just for the It shouldn't, right? Well, the government does own it for some. Well, they don't own it from the standpoint that they're generating tax revenue you all. You know what I mean? Now, you, you privatize it, and that's the incentive. It's not, it's got no intrinsic value until it's sold. You know what I mean? Why does the government want money? <laughs> so they bribe so they can drop the bombs. Uh, there's a lot going on here, right? But this is just a Desert News article. The Desert News said, the direct quote, in short, development and financial pressures prompted the move. Wow. That was the Desert News's opinion on it. So, to the point, though, about the point, the new prison did have to be built. They had to do something, right? Like, it was literally falling apart. So... Oh, yeah. really what what it was better to build it somewhere else for on the same size? Yeah. yeah, but this is this is again the desert news looked at that. They actually had the number that it took to rebuild the prison there versus the new one. Vastly different. And they said to us, it's and again, I'm not saying you have to believe this. This is opinion. They said it's development and financial pressures prompted the move. So now we have something new called the Power District. You guys heard of this one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, power District. I was amazed. I didn't realize why they called it the Power District until I saw the, the image of it. It sits right next to the power plant. Um, and you can see this in the in the artist rendering of Power District, the smoke stacks for the power plant are still there. And that's clear. Yeah. Wow, we're building this $3.5 billion development right next to these smoke stacks. That's interesting. So probably next, we're going to be moving our power plant. We'll see. Yeah, but, well, that one's going to be shut down by the federal government. So okay, to the point. Okay, there you go. Shut them all down, so it doesn't matter in the state of Utah. Yeah, can't do coal fired. Got to be here. Solar power yeah. farms. Yes, yeah. energy yeah. yeah. um, So, so the power district. Larry H. Miller comes in and says, "Hey, government, we'll put three point five billion dollars in this area. It's kind of a mess right now." And so the government says, sweet. But do you think Larry H. Miller is doing it without asking for something in return? Mm-hmm. What are they asking for in return? Baseball They're asking for almost a billion dollars for baseball stadiums. So what does Utah do? Utah passes this Utah Fair Park Area Investment and Restoration District. This is right next to the Power District. And this is, again, where it starts to get really concerning. This district comes in and it has a governing board. So this is actually just quoting the law that just passed. These are direct quotes. Um, the dot dot dots mean there was more after that, but this is direct quote. There's a governing board. Five board members control this district. The governor appoints two. One's from the Fair Park Authority Board and one's from the West Side Coalition. I've never heard of West Side Coalition before. I thought, well. Probably a group we should be aware of. They now have some power. And the Senate shall appoint as a board member. I'm sorry, not the Senate, the president of the Senate. So this isn't something that's being voted on. President of the Senate shall appoint as a board member one individual with relevant business expertise. Also known as his friend. (laughs) So relevant to what business? Larry H. Miller? I don't know. I don't know what business here is. Speaker of the House shall appoint a board member. As a board member, one individual with relevant business expertise, the host municipality shall appoint one individual as a board member. Anyone they want, right? But five people, we have no say on these people. Um, we tried. We did try. We did try. It started as a 13 group to start with, and it's gone. We tried. 13, 11, 9, 5. They, they kept whittling it down, right? Imagine that power that that group of five got. Yep. 
And so in this bill, it says uh, Fair Park District may, and then it goes through things they can do. They can bring development of land within the Fair Park District, including the development of a qualified stadium to house a major league sports team. There we go. The Utah, Utah government approved $900 million. Larry H. Miller committed $900 million. They're talking $1.8 billion for a stadium. And I was just reading about the Raiders moving to Las Vegas to move. They demanded a stadium. They built them a $1.9 billion stadium. And it was the second most expensive sports stadium in the world. We're looking at putting $1.8 billion into a stadium when Las Vegas built the second most expensive one at $1.9 billion. To me, that's a little wild, again, in this public-private partnership side of things. They can go through, they can enter into lease agreements. Now, this was fascinating. I just learned this today. I had never seen it before. Um, so I didn't make it into the slideshow. Another use of government and corporations is that the government will set up corporations itself to circumvent certain rights and protections in place. So Alpine School Board right now, they have an issue where there's tons of kids, way more kids than there are schools. They told the voters, we need $565 million in bonds, and the voters said, no way, not approving it. So Alpine says, okay, we'll do a, um, a lease, like a lease back, um, I forget what they call it, it's a lease back revenue bond or something. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is the school district will set up its own private company that owns the school. The, the school district or the city council or whoever sits on the company as its board. That company goes out and gets a loan for hundreds of millions of dollars. And it promises, it says, oh, we can fund this because we've entered into a contract with the school district. They're going to lease it from us. And look, it's a 100-year lease or whatever. And so we have guaranteed revenue from them. And we can pay you back your, your loan. Um, but the school district, to cover that, has to raise taxes. They legally can't raise taxes to this extent by directly doing it. But the Utah Supreme Court declared this leaseback option as a proper way for them to raise taxes even if the people don't want it. And so all they have to do is say, okay, you didn't want that. We'll do that. We'll set up our own company, enter into a lease agreement, private contracts. And since there's a private contract that this company can enforce in court, people will loan this company money now. They'll show up on it. How do they, how do they raise the, the school district tax rate? Mm -hmm. Truth and yeah. taxation Yeah, and the truth and taxation hearing, all it takes is you just have to sit there and, and be yelled at for a minute. Yeah, so that's it. But you don't have to, people can't vote on it. People can't overturn your lease agreement because it's not a legislative enactment at that point. We have a right to do a referendum on legislative enactments, overturn those. But a lease is not a legislative enactment. And so they can just jack them up. You will have your truth in taxation hearing. You can go yell at them all you want. But their job is just to sit there and be yelled at for a little bit and then it's over. One point we need for this group that both the Canyon School District and the Jordan School District with UEA were against the scholarship funds by the new credit. Sure. Yeah. Well, so sure. yeah. school okay. districts were school districts were very against the funds. And so what did the legislature do? We'll just talk about how they circumvented the Utah Constitution here. They wrote the Utah Constitution. Yeah, some of the legislators are not funding this year because they told us. But what did but what the government did to get the school districts on board? So the first year it went up, the school districts opposed it extensively. The second year, they said, oh, let's bundle together a raise, guaranteed raise for teachers yeah. with this yeah. to get the UEA to back down. Yeah. Well, the UEA still didn't really back down. It's still, it's still it's back down. Well, they, they were, they, they, they at least backed down enough to get it passed. Um, but the Utah Constitution states the legislature here in the state can only pass one subject per bill. And that was what, Don, I think you were talking about, where they're going, we don't care. Right. Um, there were some reps that stood up and said, this is unconstitutional, I can't vote for it. And other ones said, 
it's a good thing. We just got to do it. Yeah. Whatever it takes. But they specifically to put those two subjects together to try and get both sides to come to an agreement on two contentious issues. We're not supposed to do that in Utah. Um, and they did. And no one sued them over it. So it's still there. Um, so, but yeah, going back to this development, this Fair Park District that has these five people appointed, they have the power to assess taxes. So I'm not saying I agree with this by any means. Let me say this. Part of this was, as we've been discussing, resting or taking away some of the power from the Fair Park area because they had tried to tax that area to greatly improve it. Because if you've been in that area, it is pretty dilapidated. Right? Yeah. And so part of it was, again, I'm not saying it's right, but they were resting local control from the Salt Lake City area there and making it part of the state control area. Yeah. I'm not and saying that's right. And the city has their one person to represent them at five. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that do? What does it not do? But generally, almost every time, I, I strongly believe that that anything that's not good is actually has a lot of patience. They will wait until there is a situation that needs to be remedied or addressed, and then they'll have a remedy. And sometimes they those situations are the product of their own creation. And when I hear about the government having issues with its own people not being able to do things, I'm kind of like, well, I'll do something about it. Yeah, you can. You can do that. Now, there are obviously, it's more complex than that. But this group can, can tax. And so, in addition, the Fair Park District is shall, so that means they have to establish a loan committee. The $900 million isn't going to be spent immediately, so they're supposed to loan it out to people. Um, and so, the governor appoints two with expertise in public finance or infrastructure development. President of the Senate appoints one, Speaker of the House appoints one, and then the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House jointly appoint one. Three more friends. <laughs> so this is why it's powerful to be Speaker and President, because you get to appoint people to committees, and there's a lot of things that we just run through that. Yeah. So when we come. We can talk about what are the benefits of public-private partnerships. One of those is efficiency. The government can accomplish things cheaper through the private sector than it can through its own administration quite often. We love that quite often, and so there's a lot of push. I've heard a lot of conservatives say the government shouldn't be doing it. They should have the private sector doing it. The private sector loves that. Says, yeah. Put us in place, but um, but we've also seen some of the downsides. Do you guys have any other downsides or pros you want to bring up? Anything you want to mention to kind of help round out the discussion? Well, to your point and several of these other things, the private partnerships and even committees, because committees can hide the court in grandma, right? They can hide their discussion. Yeah, they can go off the record, right? Yeah. Have closed meetings. Yes, yeah, think of the censorship issue by making a lot of things uh, part of the private sector, exchanging communications and all of that. You can carry out draconian censorship with no problem. Yep. And one of the things that's happening is we found out the federal government's really pushing companies to say, I'll pass some policies to get rid of certain things from your platform. Yeah. That's being tested in court right now. Yeah. So I came here and I represent Warts on Public Private Partnerships. Yeah. And I'm not from here. I moved here 13 years ago. But where I come from, everything you show, you know, I agree with everything you're, you're saying. That's called getting hometown. Okay. There's a good old boy network that's putting together this deal. Okay. And there, there, there are these other things out there that are actually called Public Private Partnership. Capital P, capital P, capital P, P3s. Yeah. They're totally different than what you're talking about. And they're totally transparent. Well, some. some. But the question also becomes, in what places aren't they transparent? Because even if you... Well, like toll roads are a disaster in some places. Okay, but I can tell you that, like, 
the uh, uh, hospital I built in Vancouver, the UC Merced project in Northern California, um, was another recent P3, Long Beach Courthouse. These are completely transparent. They're, they take forever to get going. They take like four or five years to get going because they are so transparent. And then, you know, in, like I was looking up the military housing because I couldn't remember. That was a tremendously successful program back in the 90s and 2000s where the federal government should not be in the business of building housing for base, base housing for soldiers. Yep. So they created these contracts um, that included design, build, finance, operate, maintain. And the U.S. taxpayer funded $1 every eight that came from the private sector. And the private sector had a ton of strings attached. Their performance was measured. They had to finish on time. They had to be on budget or they're on the hook for the overruns. They had to be quarterly, you know, maintenance calls have to be addressed within 48 hours, 72 hours, if it's like something bad. There's all kinds of like KPIs that you have to hit in a true P3, in all three, three caps. So, you know. In a, in, a, in a good one. Harvard did a study on this. They yeah. went through and talked about. You know, they talked about ones that are well run, ones that are poorly run, a bunch of different things. And there are some shining examples. I will completely agree. There's some shining examples of the government working with private parties, really owning it, really controlling it, pushing the KPIs, holding them to contract provisions, even. Mm -hmm. uh, but look at our airport, for example. How far over budget were we on the airport? Did we do that here on the airport? We didn't. Do we do it on roads? We don't. Well, that's because there's no private sector entity that can really work on airport. That's the thing. Well, I'm talking, I'm talking just on building it. Oh, on building? Yeah. We were way over, way over on building it. Yeah. Well, everything in the last five years went about 30 to 40 percent. So for sure. I mean, I'm a general contractor. So I mean, we had projects that, you know, were bid one year at 90 million that came in after COVID at 120. For sure. And nothing changed. Yep. No, and those things happen. But even if you look at the history of road building here in Utah, um, contractors make a ton off road building. They have incredible profit margins. And they have a strategy. It's to bid low and then come in with change orders. And the government here isn't, <laughs> isn't, isn't super tight about enforcing that contract. And they will do the change orders and they'll do all these things. And so there, there are, but the point is, when, when I talk about benefits, Again, I'm trying to be honest, the government can save money working with the private sector in a healthy way. Now, we obviously have a whole host of concerns that come in. If the government's reliant on the private sector for all of their missiles and all their guns and all their tanks and all their planes, then again, kind of what starts to happen, um, especially when now we're becoming so specialized in parts, we're sourcing them from around the world. And at some point, do we need to say, hey, government, we probably shouldn't be relying on parts from around the world. We should probably have something that says if we're going to produce a part for the military, it should be manufactured in the United States, maybe. That might be more expensive. But maybe it's a cost we need to eat for national security. And I don't, I don't fully know. Um, but these are things that you look at and say, again, where are these healthy? Because when, when I look at the balance and liberty, there is a balance. We have to interact with the private sector as a government. How do we strike the balance? So what are some of the things that can be done to promote? To me, it's we're not going to ban contracts with companies. We shouldn't wholesale embrace it in all situations either. We've got to talk about what legal principles should drive where this balance is. How do we get to the place where we have these amazing situations? You know, saving on costs, great uh, runs with it. Is the Harvard Journal I read on it talked about some very successful ones and some very incredibly poorly run ones. Um, and we do use private entities quite a bit to build infrastructure, uh, roads and hospitals and government buildings and things. The government doesn't have its own people to do that, to rely on the private sector. And generally, that is better. But again, when they find a loophole, they can really exploit it too. Private sector not to do that. Um, and then there's a the whole logging side, all that kind of stuff. Um, so as we look at this, I'm going to throw out a few ideas. Not saying I'm advocating for or against any of them. You can 
tear him apart all you want, won't hurt my feelings. You can like him, won't make me feel good. You know, it's just, these are just there to promote discussion. Um, so what do you think of a non circumvention statute that says the government's banned from using a third party to do things the government isn't allowed to do? What do you guys think of that one? <laughs> I think what the citizens require is a veto power on governmental salaries. <laughs> you want him to be able to veto governmental salaries? Uh -huh. What about those they appoint to some of these private boards? <laughs> <laughs> so veto power over salaries? Yeah. It's a fun idea. What about if the governor appoints someone to a board or the president of the Senate appoints someone? Should we have a veto power over that? Well, Utah doesn't have a recall or it doesn't currently, yeah, but this is talking about some of the things that we could do because we could run a citizen referendum, go get signatures and run a bill that Utah votes on to get that in place, right? Did they not don't did, did the legislature this session did not pass something which controls the referendum? They're always passing things with the referendum. Yeah, they were so, did they raise it? Yes. What did it raise? It was eight percent. Did they raise that or I think they pushed the date to, they, they lessened the period where you can do it. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. They don't like referendums at all. They work if you get Harmons on board. That's what helped the sales tax referendum. That's true. Uh, but these are two ideas in this non circumvention statute. I'm going to hand it to Senator Weiler. He tried to pass one on a very specific issue, not wholesale. His bill, this was in this session. This is just a screenshot of his bill. It says it prohibits a law enforcement agency from contracting with or otherwise using a third party to request, review, or obtain certain genetic genealogy information if the law enforcement agency would be prohibited from undertaking the action directly. So what's happening? What is this talking about? They're trying to use people's DNA to... Uh... <clears throat> Well, not to solve crimes, but they also try to use. Um, there, there's ways that you can uh, try to trace genetics to, to certain people and certain things. Yeah, they're using it for all kinds of stuff. But the police, whenever there's a crime and they get DNA, where's the first place they go? Their own database. First place they go is Ancestry. Right. Say, hey, Ancestry, yeah. do you have a match? And we're going to issue a subpoena, or we're going to tell you have to, or maybe Ancestry is just working with them. Because there are companies that voluntarily choose to give input to the government. Did you ever go through the, um, look at the, uh, what was it? Um, it's a neighborhood app where all the next doorbells, door. next, next door. Yeah, it's next door, I think. Where if you sign up for the next door app, they said very proudly on their website, we're a public private partnership. We share information with law enforcement so you're safer. So they're right on their homepage. It's one of their big announcements. And so they choose to give it to the government. Now, what benefit do they get for that? I don't know. I don't know the next side of it. But he's here saying, hey, look, if you're prohibited from taking this action directly, you can't go do it through uh, Ancestry. Because Ancestry doesn't have the same constitutional protection we have. I can say to the government, you can't force me to give you my DNA and you say that's true unless we have probable cause, yada, yada, yada. But, um, but the government says in reverse, well, Austin, you voluntarily gave your DNA to Ancestry. Mm -hmm. That was consensual. You now have no claim over what Ancestry does with it. They share it, they do it with whatever, so they can give it to us if, if they want. And it's not a constitutional violation. So it's, again, it's a circumvention where once we choose to voluntarily give our info to someone, Google, Apple, any of these companies. Remember during COVID, Google was very proud and they notified me. And I just, you know, I never have my location on on my phone. And I know they're still following me, whatever, but I turned it off and they notified me and say, we're sharing your location data with the health department. So you can be notified if anyone in your area has COVID. And I just went, I didn't ask you to do that, Google. I want to turn it off. 
<laughs> Again, it, it was off. It was off on my phone. I still got the notification. I even went and checked after. I went, did it get turned on? Yes. And I went in. And Google's actually got in trouble because they weren't respecting it when people turned it off. They were still doing whatever. But again, but this is interesting to look at. Senator Weiler, he is trying to put this restriction in to say, hey, if you can't do it directly, don't do it through a third party. His bill sat in the Rules Committee and never made it out. It wasn't even heard by the committee. Um, and so these are points, again, does the government want restrictions on power? No, it will take some work on our part. Um, some other ideas. This is one I'm a big fan of. Brilliant. So I, I will say one I am a fan of, I guess. So maybe I will be hurt if you don't like it. Um, we have all these campaign finance laws in place. You know, if you're running for office, you have to report all kinds of things. How you spend your money, who's giving it to you. But once you're in office, do you ever have to say who's behind the bill? No. No. Not at all. I've gone up. I've pushed bills. I've got bills through work with people. You know, people in this room work together. We get bills through. There's two of us, three of us. Um, brother and I got one through. Just the two of us. No one at the legislature had any idea who was behind it. And they don't have to disclose that. What bill did you push we, ours was really <laughs> yeah. yeah. We we got this building bill. Well, you can't say though, like it might shock a lot of people in this room to know that I would say a, a, a large local religious agency has lobbyists, both locally and in the federal government, that they use extensively. Well, let, let me say I served for four years. And I never had once the LDS church come to me on one bill in four years. Yeah. And one of the big bills that at that point that our current governor pushed was getting rid of the good old, you know, iron current, you know, in, 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 bars. in the bars. And we never, and that was a discussion I never had once. Yes, they have their lobbyists, and they'll take up certain issues. But the other one that they did push there when we were there was the religious freedom that. You know, it was passed that, you know, there, but I never once, they may pick their topic, but they never came to me one time in four years. Okay. And Just this so is all, you know, this is all helpful information. Is it, one way or another, I think. Yeah. Well, they again, know, okay. they, they have, is it, we're saying that they're every, every religious organization comes down and make it to me. Is it a that, bad thing for a group that's concerned about something to hire a lobbyist? No. No. I don't believe so. Okay. Lobbyists serve a very important function. They help us communicate with government. We can't be up there all the time. There's all kinds of important things going on. What though, where does the problem come in? It's when we don't know what's going on. It's when it's behind the scenes. No one knows what's taking place. They don't know who's behind the bill, who's not. I'm a huge fan of a campaign finance style bill to say, let's disclose who's behind bills. Because then we can truly connect the dots between campaign finance funding and what laws are being passed. Right now, we know if a group donated to a candidate, but we don't know what bills they were behind. We have no idea. There's no connecting the dots. Presentation on the four cities. And one of the things Tony C made is that there are drafting attorneys who draft the bills. They also need to be. And we don't know who's telling them what language to do because that's another thing. I will write back to these attorneys and say, nope, change that language. That's exactly how it works. And no one knows who's telling those attorneys what language to change, except for maybe the sponsor of the bill. Uh, but I remember doing that. Just It was kind of like when I was in law school, my eyes were opened. I went, I clerked for a judge, clerked for a couple judges. And the judge comes in to me, was lost in second year, and he says, I have no idea what to do with this case. Write me an opinion on it, please. And I remember sitting there going, I'm a law student. Why do you want me to write the opinion? And so I did my best. I wrote an opinion. He reads it and he goes, love it. Used it, didn't change a thing. And I sat there and I went, this feels really wrong. <laughs> It really feels wrong. 
<laughs> it wasn't one of my proud moments or anything. I was going, second year law student just ruled on that case. I wasn't even in the courtroom to listen to it. All I had was just the little record the judge gave me. And I remember thinking, something's wrong. And when I was working with these drafting attorneys and I'd send them back stuff and say, no, do this instead. And then nobody knows. I went, this feels wrong. This isn't the way this should work. It shouldn't be going this way. Another one, I guess, sorry, there's two on this page I really like. I'm a big fan of saying that no bill can be voted on until it's been public for 60 days. I think that protects us and our legislators because they don't know what's in the bill. They have no idea what's in the, a lot of these bills. By the end, they, they're not reading all the bills. They're, you know, Even at the beginning, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I really like this idea. But how would you do that in Utah where we only have 45 days? Yeah. Yep. Or short -lived well, days. kind of. Because what they do is they meet in committees mm -hmm. during the year. And so bills, it can force the drafting attorneys to draft it sooner. They post it in November. Yeah. So there's a deadline in November or December. Yeah. That's the last day. If you don't get your bill posted, you can't vote on it this session. Yeah, All I, the bills I, are I there. I love it, but I'm just saying you have to have that because, yeah, our current setting is on the I think the right. challenge you do run in there in times is because, you know, you vote on a base budget at the beginning of the session. And then tell you, you don't really get the last revenue numbers until the last couple of days, and then it'll change, so they'll suspend the rules. So there are circumstances that that won't work on certain bills, but when you get into consent bills and stuff like that, those have gone through committees, and and, and also remember, and you would know this, 70 to 80% of the bills that they do every year are makeup because they got screwed up the year before because yes, right. there's a an E or an O or a comma or an something there in the wrong spot. Yeah. So yeah, they may have 1,200 bills, but 300 of them are making up for what they did because it's such a short session. Yeah. But I think if the if the legislators themselves don't know what they're passing, we are basically communicating in common process. So what is the point? Why are we all spending the password? Oh, well, it's not it's not say that all of them don't read all the bills to this. I mean you and they read it and they read it and say the people don't read how you do it. That's sixty four percent of the thing. Going I will admit I will only talk to one. That claims to have read the bill. I read the bill for four years. And I applied you for that. As so long as that came last minute with amendments, I voted no on every one of them because they were not properly vetted. If they did not go through committee, then it was an automatic no. And I believe that today because they're not properly vetted. And then we're just making up the mistake again the next year. Yeah. And, and that's, that's awesome. my own that's my own philosophy. Yeah, I love it. I know. Yes. Yeah, so you know. Uh, do you like um, when did you serve? Okay, go ahead, John. Okay, so a couple of thoughts. Is it, so when we do that for just the original writing of the bill, that no bill mm -hmm. can be voted on for the original writing because there's multiple yeah. drafts with a lot of these bills. Yeah. What about but the to I, I don't know who the rep former representative is, but I've talked to several of my representatives, and I've heard out of my representatives and a number of other representatives you know mouths. Well, the reason why I voted on this, did you read it? No. But I know the but I know the uh sponsor mm -hmm. and I trust him. I, I hear that all the time yeah and that and I, I think he agrees that happens i think he is though telling us that there are still good people up there that say no to these things and read them so we can't love everyone into the same basket right and um, we we can, we may not be able to but uh too bad he's not still in the future in every building yeah can we get you so, back in what's that so can we can we get you back in well i'm up i'm running through the house see so the answer nice. is to be people in South Jordan and Sandy vote for me. Nice. Okay, so he is running again. And I was back. only going to kill a consent bill in 32 years, so you know. Wow. I had to learn how to kill a consent bill because they're either a yes or a no. 
So that's awesome. Do you feel like the change possibly is up for the Utah law or instead of we have a 45 state session, we had like a 30 day session at the start of the year, like a 30 day session in the middle of the year or something to not have that ram through 45 day session? I think the challenge is because we are a citizen legislature and everybody has their own business. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I have a partner in a thing, an investment firm, and you know, and everybody's trying to be grandpa and grandma, and mom and dad, and yeah. teachers and principals and business owners. I mean, the uniqueness, because I've seen enough, my business is in enough states that I love the ways our art is operated versus other states, because when you're in there, you know, in a and it's a full time thing. Yeah. What is what is the legislator's job time, in California? Maybe, I think they get bought and paid for more than what. Mm -hmm. I, I just that's my own personal feeling from reading enough <laughs> bills and different things like that. That I it's tough, but oh, yeah. the way and we did it was Senator Osmond here to his credit that started no more boxcar bills that come out in the last you know twenty four hours of the sessions and so he was a big one that. We started that legislation to get rid of some of that because yeah, those are so detrimental with what's going on. Yep. And California, they have a full time legislature. No, no I don't want that. Their job yeah, is I don't want that. pass bills, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. That's just a good deal. But no, but to the point, can it be split up? But now, right now, the legislature calls himself in this, or the governor calls himself in this session quite a bit. Yeah, there's no special sessions that there's can. two or three generally that take place. So again, some ideas to go through. Sorry, Billy, go ahead. No, you, you can keep going, actually. I didn't want to ask a question for the ad. Um, another one is potentially, is it possible to ban appointees from benefits? If you're appointed to a committee or one of these cool ballparks, can any business you're associated with get money from it? Um, now, whether this one's possible in enforcement or not, I have no idea. I think it's very difficult and complex to track down conflicts of interest and all these things. Um, but... It's a potential idea to say if someone's going to serve on this committee, you can't you can't get any money from. I sure have known a couple of them in that six years that I haven't been in there, and all we would get is our meals and food or yeah, um, and housing. But other than that, or you know, hotel. Yeah, per diem. Yeah, from other than that, per diem. Other than that, most of them in the state of Utah, you don't get any any benefits. So there's laws already in place in Utah. That's, Take care of some of that, but I, I'm, I'm talking from the private side. Okay, yeah. Can it come to hire you? Of these commissioners being be that uh, uh, selected for the fair park deal and then having a business in the years for paving subcontractor. Yeah, I'm going to go on to the, I think it's the Grand Marshal or their brother. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. So these are, yeah. and again, these are things I'm not here to say that these don't need more refining or that they're bad or good to say there are ways to put checks and balances in place. Yep. Do you think it's possible to put all three into one bill? All three of these things? <laughs> one bill <laughs> 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 to, have a, to have a check and balance bill? Um, they, I'm sure, would enforce the Utah Constitution on that. <laughs> that one they'd say, oh, only one second. Yeah, well, if you could have this clear, that would be, I don't think anybody would balk on that. Idea at all on this one? Yes, I right. even sponsor. I don't. I think it's a great idea. Okay. So there's some that maybe we get through the legislature. Maybe some require referendum. Absolutely, that'd be a great idea. This would be a part of transparency. I, I mean, think that's that, what we're asking for. I agree, but I'm saying if I went back to the fair park bill, I think there'd be a lot of people who would not want that in the fair park bill. Because they want to say so so that so so would impact that. They would oh, the Prince, that out. Prince isn't a perfect example is the, both the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate put in the bill because they are both real estate and developers. Yeah, right. They put it in the bill that they could have nothing to do with any development whatsoever. People said, oh, that's a line that's not been. We, I was on that committee. I, we voted for that and Niederhauser and Hughes totally took themselves out. Themselves, but they didn't take. No, they took them and their companies out. Their development yeah. companies. I mean, I mean, you can't, but they don't, and they still look to this day. Either of them. Yeah, and so I think to your point, though, there might be appetite to pass that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. To pass something like that, and again, these are things 
I'm sure there's a lot more things. Um, but to me, when we look at private corporations, we can't just say, oh, uh, free market, let people know what they want to do. We have to realize there needs to be checks and balances. Yeah. That's one of the things I believe. You need to be proactive about saying, let's put the checks and balances in place. Let's not be the 16th Amendment that just says, oh, yeah, let's take that off. No offense, nothing. Do whatever you want with it. If we're going to give the government power, we should only give it if there's checks and balances with it. Anytime the government wants something new from us, there might be a need for it. There really might be a justifiable explanation for that situation. But don't give it without checks and balances in place. Do you think it, I think you may have talked about this when I was gone, but do you think it's possible to go back to where the founding fathers wanted it apportioned statewide, like to different states or like even in the state of Utah where you apportion it to, I don't know, like Salt Lake's more dense. So maybe they get more if they have more roads and more buildings or more water sewage system. I don't know. Yeah. It's a good question. Some of the systems. And like here. I think if we're going to walk back that power, that's a ton of power the government has, the federal government. We don't have a referendum process to get anything through the federal government. I think we'd have to be a little bit more clever to start to attack that and chip away at putting checks and balances on the federal government, because I don't think they're going to relinquish that power voluntarily. But I do think we could get um, innovative and come up with ways to start to look away at it. I do believe that. With so many of these obvious legal violations that were pointed out earlier, does the state attorney general have the independent authority to be going around, oh, let's say to some visit some certain individuals and some certain private clubs and saying, sorry, fellas, you know, there's a problem here. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm a big believer the attorney should the attorney general should be a serious check of ballots. Big believer in that. <laughs> and you know what the only two legend or the only two seats in the state that are allowed to actually do true public private partnerships are in It's the UTA. Or no, it's UDOT. It's UDOT, right? I'd say. And student housing. That's it. So if we were trying to do something else, okay, so it's like, it would have to it would have to have enabling legislation. This is their end around because ballparks are student housing there. Trend. Yeah, and there's, but again, when you, the, the true ones I agree with, but when we get into these ones that are more special districts, like, well, even just saying the government pays, you know, Reserve America for team states, and they start in terms of conditions, there starts to become this whole mingling of companies and, and business. Same with them, um, the government going to Ancestry and getting DNA. They're doing that. And DNA and ancestry is working with them. And so then it becomes incumbent on us to say, okay, how are all the ways this is rolling out? What's trying to happen? Because we do start to lose constitutional rights as the government gets more creative about utilizing private partners to do things. And so does ancestry have any risk in that scenario? I mean, are they violent in their terms of service? As long as their terms of service say they can share it, just like the one we saw from Reserve America, give us any United States or any country we want. Ancestry says the same thing. So that legally, there's no risk unless it becomes illegal. <clears throat> so, um, but I really appreciate you guys coming. But again, if you want any, if you want to sign up to know more about these in the future, but thanks for being here. And thanks to those for who were online. Appreciate it.